Welcome to the Real Estate Raw Show, hosted by Joe Mendoza. Do you know what a phase one or phase two report is? What does EIR stand for? Environmental Impact Report. Well, if you're investing in larger properties, maybe doing a land development, buying a mobile home park, well, you've got to listen and know what this is. When you're doing your due diligence in real estate, do not, do not neglect something like this, which could really mess you up on your investment and your potential numbers on your pro formas. So make sure you take plenty of notes today. If you like what you're watching, what you're hearing, subscribe, smash that bell, share with a friend. Really, really appreciate the feedback, the comments, the likes, anything. Enjoy the show. Hi, guys. Joe Mendoza here in sunny San Diego. Welcome to my show. Thanks so much for watching, subscribing. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I have Mr. Michael Renz from the great state of Ohio. Uh, Renz & Associates works for a broad spectrum of clients, including law firms, manufacturers, municipalities, state government, petroleum marketers, real estate developers, banks, and lenders. We're going to be talking a lot about why his business is very important to most investors out there. Michael Renz, welcome to the show. How are you? Joe, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for taking time out of your day. So let's go ahead and get started. Before uh, you, you started helping real estate investors and developers, what were you doing? How did you transition into your business model? Well, I am. Um... First of all, I'm a geologist, and that's a really broad thing. Um, most geologists make their living with oil. Early on, I thought water is going to be more important. Now, water relates to uh, real estate is that groundwater is how the bad stuff gets from where you dump it to where you don't want it to be. And the thing that most real estate investors really want to avoid is buying a site that's contaminated. And that's what uh, what we study. The um, I uh, worked for a number of uh, traditional firms. And then about 26 years ago, after spending enough time in the corner office and seeing how things really worked, I realized that there was this financial threshold for redeveloping polluted sites. Um, very often, these are really desirable sites. But tradition the traditional business model of a, of a big firm, you could only solve problems where the numbers were big enough. And it, you know, so the, the corner lot where you could put a CVS or a mobile home park or, you know, a, a corner gas station that might make, you know, a great McDonald's or a strip mall, sometimes it got overlooked. So I opened up Renz and Associates with a little different uh, idea. Rather than um, going out and subcontracting, we invested in things like uh, Geoprobe and high pressure injectors and all this really cool Johnny Quest, G Wiz kind of science stuff. And uh, this has allowed us to, you know, look at sites for, for investors and say, yes or no, it's, you know, is it polluted or is it not? And sometimes, you know, if it's polluted, that's kind of a good thing. That's an opportunity. We'll go in and we'll do the study and we'll figure out what it's going to take to clean it up. The client will buy it for a, a, a lower price, lower than what it would, you know, the cost of cleanup. We'll do the cleanup and they'll move on. Um, let me give you a quick case history that probably illustrates this uh, pretty well. We had a client who was in the manufactured home business. They came across a steel plant that was abandoned. It was an urban blight. I mean, it was a scary place. It had trichloroethylene in the soil and groundwater. This is a hazardous waste. You do not want to buy a site polluted with hazardous waste. But this facility, this, this old steel mill, it had lots of physical resources that were, were valuable, like overhead cranes. And it was also in an urban environment where the local population, was. it was a perfect fit for the jobs that would be created if we could just get this environmental issue out of the way. And so we did our, our study and um, rather than digging it all up and hauling this hazardous waste off. We used a special method where we got microbes in the soil to disassemble it. Usually when you clean up a site, you're moving pollution. Uh, what we typically do is we destroy it, we disassemble it. It's sort of like a, you might have a ring of benzene and we'll come in and 
using native bacteria or hydrogen peroxide will break the hydrogen and uh, carbon bonds, the pieces and parts, carbon dioxide and water. And how this relates to real estate is it's very, very affordable. Um, it uh, is fast. So our client bought the site, we cleaned it up. They started making manufactured housing there. Uh, it created local jobs. It got rid of an urban blight. I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful uh, story. Wow, that's interesting, Michael. Now, the phase one, phase two EIR, some people know what it is. Some people have zero clue. Uh, environmental impact reports, phase one, phase two. Please explain a little bit about what that is, what that means to somebody potentially looking at some land to invest or buy. Well, the, the thing that people always hear is that these phase one environmental assessments were de um, developed to help people qualify for the innocent purchase of uh, defense under Superfund. Superfund is not, doesn't protect the environment. It's a cost recovery mechanism that the feds have. If you buy a, a site polluted with hazardous waste, boom, you're it. They can knock on your door and say, you need to clean this up or we're gonna find a Dickens out of you or whatever. But if you perform all due inquiry, you look over under every leaf, twig and rock that you're supposed to, and don't find anything. But uh, for some reason later, it's discovered that it's polluted with ethyl methyl bad stuff. It's environmental Passover. When EPA bangs on your door, you show them your phase one report that said it was clean. And they go, okay, we'll, we'll go to the next person in, in the chain of title and cause them problems. You'll have problems at that point, but US EPA won't be one of them. That's the reason we all hear. Now, here's why people really do it. Um, many sites are impacted with things that are not hazardous waste. When you buy a piece of real estate, you wanna know, does this have an environmental problem? Uh, it could impact its value. There's all kinds of things that uh, aren't covered by Superfund. There are even environmental problems that the state and the feds don't care about, but your banker will. So we do these initial due diligence studies to figure out, is there likely a problem here? And the studies conclude one of two ways. Either A, we found no recognized environmental conditions. Have a nice day, that's the end of it. Or B, we found the following things that are suspicious. It's a bit like going to, uh, phase one is a bit like having an annual physical um, exam with your doc. She may poke around and prod, she might find something that, oh, I don't like you know, what that looks like. It could be a problem, could, maybe it's not. That's kind of the phase one study. Where phase two comes in is the doc will go, we need to punch a hole right there and take a piece and send it to the lab. And that's what we do. At the end of a phase one, if we say, well, there were underground storage tanks here, or there was landfill next door, or there were a mining waste, or I mean, there's a litany of these things. We need to find out yes or no, is it a problem? And that's where the phase two comes in. Phase two just means we're gonna take samples and find out if it's a problem. It doesn't mean we're gonna turn it into a science fair project, spend tons of money and figure out, you know, how extensive it is. That's, that's later on. Uh, phase two is just, is it polluted? Yes or no, I wanna know. But um, these studies, these phase one studies are all done pretty much the same way. There's a recipe that we all have to follow. The big variable is, is, is the cook, who does them? Um, there is a, a, a lot of judgment involved. There, there are data sources that we all use, but the real key is coming down to the person who does it. Have they, you know, there's some things that you just never expect to find that you wouldn't even recognize. Um, and people are amazed. I had no idea this was a dump site. I had no idea there was a 12,000 gallon underground storage tank right in the middle of the property. But uh, if you've been around the block, you know, 30 or 40 times, um, you'll spot those things. So tell us about, like you, you mentioned earlier, that you go all across the country. Any interesting finds uh, or things that like really blew you away? Uh, like a dinosaur bone or something like that. <laughs> tell, tell, tell the audience. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll promise not to talk too much about uh, uh, dinosaurs, um, but I love them. Yeah, we have found some. We have found some stuff you would not believe. Um, this is a cool one. 
we had a client who had a phase one done by a big national firm. And they spent, I think, $5 million on a mobile home park. And the mobile home parks, if you've been following the, the affordable housing market, these things are really hot. They're really, we watch our clients get rich investing in them. Well, the report came back and said, we found no problems. Well, to the west, upwind of it, was an old landfill that had been dug into, had been put into a quarry, a limestone quarry, bad place to do that. And the thing was on fire, but it was like a mine fire. The fire was down in the fill. And the uh, quarry was sort of shaped like a figure eight. And the fire was in the south end, but up in the north end, there were, get this, radioactive waste materials left over from the Manhattan Project. I kid you not. I'm biting my tongue not to say too many specifics here. And what was going to happen is that fire was moving up there. And it, when it got to the place where the, the rad waste was, if it made it, the uh, cover would collapse and a bunch of radionuclides would go into the atmosphere. And our client's property was just downwind. Well, the fire hadn't got there. The state and the feds were involved. The landfill operator was involved and they just couldn't figure out how to stop the fire, even though it's really kind of a straightforward thing. Meanwhile, our client's competitor were sending flyers to his tenant saying, this bad thing's gonna happen. It's Chernobyl right here, you know, move to our mobile home park. And he was like, oh my gosh, you know, I put $5 million in this. Everybody's fleeing and now it's, you know, people consider our park to be unlivable. And he, it got turned around, but that was exciting. We found, we found some other things though that are, um, that are mind blowing. I was, uh, I was looking at some property in the Midwest for a client and I was in the weeds. It was, um, uh, they were buying it for development. And as I was, you know, going through the weeds, looking for uh, signs of contamination, whatnot, I came across some building foundations I'd never seen before, really weird stuff. So I got out uh, my iPhone and, and called one of my associates who has dealt with some, some exotics. And I said, Todd, have a look at this. Man, what, what is this stuff? And he goes, it's a munitions plant. I said, Todd, we've done all the background research. We've studied everything for a mile out. There's nothing. He goes, well, what you have there, Mike, is um, it's where they made the detonators. And I said, okay. What's the chemistry? What's the problem here? He goes, well, the chemistry is pretty simple. The problem is when they'd have a bad detonator or something, they often just dug a hole and buried it. So when the client's in there putting in water lines or grading for streets, or perhaps the development goes up and some kid's out in a field playing army and digging a foxhole and she excavates a detonator. I mean, it's just who in the world would have thought unexploded ordnance would have been a problem. It was, uh, it was mind, it's mind blowing. But wow. uh, we, we do find exotic things. Our little team is pretty diverse. And uh, we recently had a situation where a client was buying property to develop. And th this is, this is odd as can be. It was in an area, it was, I'll just say the state, it was in Missouri. Lots of lead mining had gone on. We had done all the background research, didn't find any mine stuff. And uh, we pulled some surface soil samples. And this is gonna be a residential development. And I looked at the lab results. The lead was smoking hot. It's like, holy cow. And I talked to one of my associates whose expertise is, is particulate transport. And she said, do you know how that got there? Tornadoes. Tornadoes came through, sucked up mine tailings, from a site a mile away and then blew them like toxic rain out of the top and it settled all over the place. I mean, who would have known? So it's not all that exciting. You know, we, we find the dump, we find the underground storage tanks, things like that. And those are exciting, but that's some of the weirder stuff. That's interesting, Michael. <laughs> now, now down the street, there was this development that recently went up. For a while, I was looking at that dirt and wondering, hey, you know what? It's right in the path of progress. But uh, I, from what I heard, they didn't build because there was arsenic in the ground. Then a few years later, all of a sudden, somebody starts building 
could you explain maybe on an assumption how that progressed or how it got cleaned up? I, I didn't check all the information, but I'd love to hear it from an expert like you, uh, how that all may have developed. Well, it, um, I, I'll try to restrain um, my nerd impulse to go into too many technical details, but heavy metals like arsenic, there's not a lot you can do with them except haul them away. A lot of times when we're dealing with ethyl methyl bad stuff like trichloroethylene, petroleum, we can pull it apart and turn it into carbon dioxide and water, but heavy metals, they're just bad. And the only way to really cope with them, is, well, there's two ways. One is sequester them. And we can lock up lead, cadmium, uh, arsenic with, uh, by playing with the, the pH of the soil, usually applying lime and putting a cap over it. And if you can create so much separation between the surface people are going to live on and the uh, heavy metals, sometimes that works. Personally, I don't like it um, because there's always the X factor. Somebody's going to dig something up someday. Most of the time, it just gets hauled off. But in that case, I, I don't know the numbers. But I will add this. When you test soil, when somebody looks at a site and says, can you test this for to see if it's contaminated? There's not one test that says something's contaminated. There is just a, a rainbow of, of chemicals that um, can be in, in soil or groundwater. You, you know, it's sort of like a trip to, to your physician. You have to know what you're looking for and where to look for it. Sometimes when you do soil, you can pick up one piece of soil and you just happen to get the nastiest piece of soil on that property. Everything else is great. It's just maybe a car dripped on it. Maybe it's just a little bit of fill that got mixed in. Maybe it's a cinder, you know? Um, so it tests high in heavy metals. So with, with, with soil, contaminated soil, you really have to do a lot of sort of like grid sampling to figure out, you know, what's the extent? Because soil doesn't mix. You know, if you dump uh, nasty stuff in one end of a, a swimming pool, it'll naturally mix and spread to the other. So you can grab one sample out of a swimming pool, you know it's in the swimming pool. Fill that swimming pool with dirt and dump something nasty in it. You pull one sample out of it, you don't really know what's in the swimming pool. So anyway, I'm not sure how they solved that problem, but unless they hauled it off, they probably sequestered it. Great, great. That's interesting, Michael. Now, um, if somebody were to reach out to you, I know this is all dependent on a lot of different variables, but maybe in a quick and easy how long and how much would somebody expect to work with you? How long of a period of time and how much would they expect to spend as far as ranges when they're you know, starting to consider working with you? Well, you know, real estate investors should always start out with a phase one environmental assessment. Like I said, it's just you know, to figure out what are we dealing with? And those studies, they're standardized. They, pretty much everybody charges the same. You know, it's, um, usually, $2,200 to $2,500. And if that turns up something, it says, we think there could be a problem here. Say we found out there used to be a farmhouse here that had a heating oil tank. Well, um, rather than go in and, and do a science fair project, we'd go in and we'd drop one hole. We'd figure out where it was, test that spot. Because the question we're interested in is not how contaminated it is. It's yes or no, is it contaminated? And then once the client gets that, you know, they'll figure out if they want to proceed. And the cost of doing that is usually about almost the same price as a phase one. You know, it's, it's usually about, you know, $2,000 to $3,000. Um, because if, if you get a bad answer where you have to walk away, you don't want to have spent $10,000 studying something that you're not going to buy or use, you know. But I will say this, we have a number of sophisticated clients that look for that dented can. And uh, we'll find a piece of, uh, of ground that's polluted. It might be impacted with, uh, say it's an old gas station site, perfect for leasing out to, to uh, CVS or McDonald's or whoever. And we'll, they'll keep putting money in this because they, they've done their homework. We'll figure out how polluted it is. Then we'll figure out, okay, here's what it's going to cost to clean up. It's going to cost $150,000. And then that client will go back and they'll negotiate a, 
$300,000 discount. We'll do the, the work and it comes in, we only spend $100,000 and they're ahead. And um, we have a few folks that do that. Um, but like I said, they're sophisticated clients and they know what they're doing. That's awesome. And then how long would that typically take from start to finish hiring you and looking forward to doing those reports? Well, it depends. You know, um, environmental problems are either found to the regulated world where there's, you know, rules and things that you have to follow and there's agency and approval involved. That, and that really slows things down. That can be years. Um, but a lot of these opportunities with contaminated sites, they fall into the brownfield sites. Um, states will have what are called voluntary action programs where you can clean it up and you can run it through the agency and get their blessing, or you can just do it on your own and go, yeah, here are the numbers that the state says are okay, we're done. Um, in terms of how long, it depends on the nature of the contamination. Sometimes we can just go in and take a surgical approach. You know, we figure out the contamination covers an area like this and we chop that area out and we haul it off to a special landfill and that's it. Other times it's not so easy. It's in, you know, it's in, in groundwater, you know, 12 feet below grade and there's historic brick buildings on both sides. So we'll treat it like, like somebody might treat cancer. We come in and uh, we'll inject uh, concentrated hydrogen peroxide that busts apart the, the contaminants and breaks it down. It might take a year or so, but we don't disrupt the site. So it's it's very site specific. It's it's very much like almost like practicing medicine, but your patient is dirt. <laughs> With that said, Michael, that just summed it up. That was awesome. Best way to get a hold of you. Anything else you'd like to share? Well, we're a small boutique firm, and um, I have to confess this right up front: we're staffed by nerds. We really we we're. We watch the numbers for our clients, but we're just not a heavy overhead firm. Um, we're, we're in it for the adventure. Most of us have over 30 years of experience. My hair hasn't gone gray or fallen out, but I'm almost 65 years old. And I wouldn't be doing this another, you know, 40 years. But um, my point is this, a good place to start is just give us a call if you've got a question, because unlike lawyers, we'll talk to you forever for free just for the fun of it. Um, this, this stuff is, is I, I would pay to have this job. So give us a call. That's, that's the easiest thing to do. All right, perfect. Do you want to give a number out there? You betcha. We're here in Columbus, Ohio at 614-538-0451. Again, that's 614-538-0451. And because none of us are corporate types, that bounces from the office to a cell phone. So you might hear equipment in the background or whatever. Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate you ha having you and we wish you well. Thanks, Joe. This was a riot. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope you learned as much as I did or more. So guys, look at the comment thread. If you seen something or heard something, want to learn more about something, please put it on the comment link below. If you're not a subscriber yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Go ahead and smash that bell to hear the latest and greatest on the show. Follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. I'm putting this channel together to hopefully add incredible value to you. And if you wanna learn more about investing, you're new to investing, I highly recommend this book, Flex with a Plex. Also this book, if you're having some challenges, as you can see, everybody on the show had some kind of adversity, including yours truly. So I shared a lot of that on make it a comeback, giving you some incredible tips to make a comeback. So get either one, Plex with a Plex, or make it a comeback. If you wanna get more tips, go ahead and go to joemendoza.com. Again, subscribe, share, like, Make a comment below. I really, really appreciate you. Want to add incredible value and wish you all the best in your success in real estate and in life. Take care. Our company is not responsible for the success or failure of your business decisions relating to any information presented by our company or our company programs, products, and or services.